during the year under review, we witnessed the harassment of even small enterprises. We bring to mind how mobile phone operators were thrown off the streets just for window dressing to show 20 heads of state who are coming to Lusaka that Lusaka is clean. We removed telephone boots, money, mo mobile boots. And now where are those people languishing in our compound? Who has destroyed their lives? MW. It is not only small and medium enterprises that have been harassed. Even big businesses have been harassed. And you know, you are reading in the papers how these businesses are also being followed every day. They are being harassed every day because they are believed to be PF sponsors, PF sympathizers, or that they are, they are competitors. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not surprising that 17 long months after forming government, Mr. Haga Inde Ijidema is still blaming the PF for the poor performance of the economy. Imagine. Mm. <laughs> I say it is not surprising because those of us like me who know Haga Inde Ijidema for many years know him as a motivational speaker but not a performer. That's right. <laughs> Even then we knew what more Zambians are now coming to know about him. That the man believes, even in his own lies, he believes his own lies. Once he tells a lie, he believes it, he convinces himself that it's true. <laughs> huh? I am not saying this from, the, from without, and I don't mean to demean the president, but the truth of the matter is that he makes himself believe his, his own delusion. I'll give a few examples in case somebody wants to quarrel with me. I'll give a few examples. Remember how convinced he was when he said these words. Vote for me at 10 hours. I'm sworn in at 12 hours. 14 hours, the dollar will be 10 kwacha. You know, for some of us, when you are saying something that you don't believe in, you can see it on the face. But for Bali, I have to respect him for his ability to say even lies in such a manner that he will convince you. He has that ability. Another example I can give you. Remember how youths turned out on the queues to go and vote when he said to us, the petrol prices will reduce to 12 kwacha a liter because PF are stealing through their middlemen three kwacha per liter. I'll reduce it from 15 kwacha to 12 kwacha. When he was saying that, you believed him. And he believed himself. That's what I'm saying. He is a man who believes even his own lies. <laughs> Remember how convinced he was when he told all of us Zambians, October 2021, after he win elections, the price of a bag of 50 kg bag of mini meal will be 50 kwacha. Imagine how he convinced farmers, even people in the rural areas, they turned out to vote because the man was convincing because he had convinced himself. When he said, I promise you farmers, when I come, I'll give you eight bags of fertilizer each. Remember what he said to the farmers. When I come, I'll come and pay you 250 kwacha for a bag of maize. You know, in my life I've been taught one thing. If you want to convince people, convince yourself first. And if a person can convince himself, by words such as these that I've quoted, he convinces himself that yes, I'll reduce the price of petrol. And when the time comes, you ask him, have you reduced it? Then he says, PF. <laughs> <laughs> then you should know that that person qualifies to be called BMW. In Tonga, it, is, it says, Bali Muntu Wabubeja. 
<laughs> Countrymen and women, the poor performance of the economy, from the way I've explained it, might not be understood by many people. But this can be demonstrated by the basic needs and nutritional basket, which only a few months ago stood at 9,400 kwach per month. 9,400 kwacha to feed a family of six. How many Zambians earn 9,400 kwacha? Today they have told us that they have increased the minimum wage for a domestic worker to 1,300. But the domestic need is 9,300. 9,400. How many Zambians are living below that food basket? It's the majority of Zambians. But also, my dear countrymen and women, during this period of festive season, every year you hear firecrackers popping in places. This year, how many firecrackers did we hear in our township? <laughs> the deafening silence and lack of shopping and lack of celebration activities during this festive season is a big testimony to the serious economic challenges our people are facing. The cost of living is at its highest ever. There has never been a time in the history of Zambia when a bag of mini-meal costed 20% of the lowest salary. Today, that is the case with regard to the revised minimum wage of a domestic worker of 1,300 kwacha. If you compare 240 kwacha bag of mini-meal to 1,300 kwacha minimum wage for a domestic worker, that's 20% of that person's earning. 20% goes to only one bag of mini-meal. How can that person survive? Let me now move to the state of governance. We have witnessed the wanton abuse of state institutions as seen during the Kavushi, Kwacha and Usangazi by-elections. We in the PF were unrelented in standing by our constitutional right to field our adopted candidates. Against all odds, we were treated to a very shocking situation where two courts of the same judiciary delivered conflicting judgments on the same matter and on the same day. We were also rudely shocked to be treated to a rapidly convened election process which left the PF out of the race. We were more shocked to see people celebrating a victory which was, for all intents and purposes, a one-horse one race. Can you imagine you have your own horse racing on its own because you have stopped other horses to race. And when it crosses the line, the finish line, you celebrate, Na wina! Na wina! <laughs> the violence that we witnessed in various by-elections and the violent inhibition of our candidates from filing nominations as happened in Southern Province calls for us in the PF and all other democracy-loving citizens to brace ourselves for the armor that is needed to protect our rights to vote for candidates of our choice. I want to sound this very clearly. This will not come easily. We need to be resilient and firm. Hagainde will not give it to us on a silver platter. We have to stand resolved to make sure that we give ourselves our democratic right. That's right. We have also seen the abuse of law enforcement agencies where they have been turned into tools of oppression and harassment, especially against the opposition. During the year under review, under the watch of Mr. Hagainde, we witnessed several citizens being arrested and detained for as long as 14 days when the law limits such detention to 48 hours only. Currently, we know of the recent issue of Kaiser Zulu. Even after the court has the man was abducted and not be traced for months on end, only to be rescued by alert neighborhood youths who later became victims of threats of the same agencies that should have thoroughly investigated the abductions in the first place. 
we were shocked to hear that such a heinous crime as abduction and sexual slavery was referred to by President Hagainde as gender-based violence. How can the abduction of citizens, enslaving of citizens, they are kept away in hiding for months? How can the president say this is gender-based violence? <laughs> what can be more heinous than keeping a person in slavery? The fight against corruption has been turned into a program to destroy and silence senior leaders of the opposition and those feared to be business competitors. For example, we were shocked to hear President Hagainde at his Christmas motivational rally when appointing officers of state when he, say, when he warned that you will see what will happen to the KCM matter. How can the president say I'm appointing SEC Director General, I'm appointing DPP, and because of these appointments, you will see what will happen to the matter of KCM. Has he already judged? Or is he giving instructions? And you call that good governance? The president of a country is a president for all, even for the accused, he's president. And as president, he has to make sure that the rights of even the accused are protected. It is not that the president is only president for the righteous. No. He is president even for the accused. And the accused should go to him and say, my rights are being infringed upon. But in this particular case, he is saying that those accused of, of ill-doing in KCM must not go to him as president to say they have rights. What president is he? Zambia is not a country of angels. No, Zambia is a country of human beings. Fallible human beings. Human beings who make mistakes. And all of us deserve to have our rights protected by the head of state. What disturbed us about that warning is that it clearly shows that Mr. Hagainde will not stop at anything to direct the operations of even state offices that are sacrosanct. The Constitution says very clearly that the office of the DPP shall operate without undue interference from anybody. That's what the Constitution says. But the President is one who tells us, you will see I've appointed this DPP, Muzachi Wonamanje. He is DPP, let him do his work. Don't interfere with his work. Don't make the DPP appear to be receiving instructions from you because if we believe that society would have no respect for the office of the DPP. We advised him when he moved Anti-Corruption Commission to State House, we told him this is wrong. He did not listen. My dear countrymen and women, Mr. Againde yesterday had the time and the money, state money, to celebrate what he terms as the abolishment of the death penalty. Yesterday he was celebrating at State House. He called people from across the country, chiefs from far-flung areas. He paid for their coming to Lusaka to come and have a lunch to celebrate the so-called abolishment of the death penalty. <laughs> it is either my brother, Mr. Hagainde Ijilema, is ill-informed by his advisors, or he has a hidden agenda under his sleeve. We say this because the president ought to know that the death penalty, even after yesterday, still exists in Article 12 of the Constitution, which states, and I quote, a person shall not be deprived of his life intentionally except, except in execution of the sentence of a court in respect of a criminal offense under the law in force in Zambia of which he has been convicted, end of court. That means Article 12 of the, of the Constitution gives power to a judge to hand down a death sentence for any criminal offense which exists in Zambia. That means the death penalty is there. Now, Article 
uh, one sub article four of the same constitution states as follows and i quote the validity or legality of this constitution is not subject to challenge by or before a state organ or other forum end of quote the vital provisions of the Bill of Rights, of which Article 12 is a part, can only be amended by way of a referendum. That's right. Mm -hmm. The question is, what authority does Mr. Hagainde have to challenge the validity of Article 12 of the Constitution? What authority does he have? Mr. Hagainde should be sincere to the Zambian people and say to us, the Zambian people, that what he did was simply to amend the penal code to make the death penalty non-mandatory. That's what he did. He just made it non-mandatory. He must not say I abolished the death penalty. No. He made the death penalty non-mandatory. But it still exists in the constitution. I just want to advise him that such public gymnastics, when you start playing gymnastics, political gymnastics, with the feelings of the people, they will lead you into trouble. They will lead you into self-destruction. By the way, he should be reminded that the last time there was a warrant of execution signed by any president in Zambia, the last time a person was sentenced to death. The last time such a person was killed in Zambia was 28 years ago. 28 years ago. By then, Hagainde was only 33 years old. That was the last time a person was committed to death. 28 years ago. Zambia has been a de facto abolitionist country for as long as that. For 28 years, Zambia has been an abolitionist country. All successive presidents from Levi Manawasa wanted the death penalty abolished. If somebody cares to go and read the report that I presented on behalf of President Edgar Chagwalungu to the United Nations peer review mechanism, I did indicate that it was the desire of Edgar Chagwalungu to abolish the death penalty. However, the reason why the previous presidents did not abolish it was because they understood that they could only do so meaningfully, truthfully, and sincerely by amending the constitution through a people-centered referendum and not by decree. In Zambia, we are a democracy. You don't amend the constitution by decree. You amend, especially by, by part three of the constitution, through a people referendum. The people themselves must express themselves on the death penalty. It is not up to one individual. No. Actually, Nidai remind me, he was the main sponsor against the referendum to amend the Bill of Rights in 2016. Has he forgotten? Yeah. Only six years ago, he was the major campaigner against the referendum. When we said, let us amend the Bill of Rights, he campaigned vigorously against it. When we said, let us remove the death penalty from the Constitution, he campaigned against it. Wherever UPND won in 2016, the referendum failed. Wherever PF won, the referendum succeeded. Should we remind him that? Hadn't it been for Hagainde's unfettered appetite for political rhetoric, the Bill of Rights could have been amended in 2016. The death penalty would not have been on the Constitution now. But because of his hypocrisy, he fought against the referendum because he wanted to make all other presidents look bad. So he comes and says, for the first time, for the first time, <laughs> for the first time I've abolished the death penalty, for the first time. Mulungu <laughs> Azamulanga. Countrymen and countrywomen, we are also aware that the repeal of the law against the defamation of the president is another public relations stint. 
my friends who have been threatened to be arrested for defaming the president. If you celebrate now that, oh, this law has been repealed, you are celebrating too early. This is a public relations stint. It's another gymnastics. We say this on the backdrop of the fact that in the 17 months of presidency of Haga Inde Ijidema, 17 months, there have been more people arrested for defaming the president than the number of people who are arrested under the six presidents put together. Mm. <laughs> huh? In 17 months, more citizens have been arrested than were arrested under six presidents. <laughs> At this stage, all we can say is, countrymen and women, watch the space. There is nothing to celebrate yet. Watch the space. Let us wait and see how long it will take before another citizen is arrested for expressing opinions not in the liking of other Indes keepers. Even I sitting here today, calling him openly, Bali Muntuabufi. They can come and arrest me. They can come and arrest me. So don't celebrate countrymen and women. Don't celebrate gymnastics. Wait until the reality dawns. My dear countrymen and women, let me move to another important sector, the health sector. The health sector has literally collapsed. The shortages of medicines, medical supplies and laboratory reagents has gone on for over a year now. It has gone on for as long as President Haga India has been president of Zambia. This was confirmed by the report on medicine and medical supply shortages countrywide conducted by the Parliamentary Committee on Health and Community Development. What saddens us are the continuous denials by government despite the availability of abundant, verifiable information on the crisis. The Committee of Parliament established that the availability of HIV and AIDS and TB drugs and vaccines stood at 53.1%, contrary to the WHO minimum recommendations of 70 to 80 percent. Actually, all these drugs were donations. Can you imagine all the drugs which the parliamentary committee found in our health facilities countrywide, all of them were all donations. They were not bought by your taxpayers' money. They were donations. Hadn't there been donations, what could have happened? Uh. There could have been zero drugs on HIV, zero drugs on TB. All we have to say is, thank you God that there are some people who are kind to Zambia and they can give us free medicine. Otherwise we could have been dying like chickens. The availability of the 13 essential drugs, 13 essential drugs, declared essential drugs by the WHO, those drugs were only 23% in the country. 23%. Meaning, out of every 10 people who go to the hospital, only two will be given medicine. The rest will have to be sent away with prescriptions without money in their pockets. They may have enlisted 11,000 people for recruitment, and I'm saying enlisted because to say employed is a different word. It's a misnomer. The truth of the matter is not all the 11,000 have been put on payroll yet. So they have enlisted 11,000 people for recruitment in health sector. How, however, I want to ask you countrymen and women, of what use is it to employ 11,000 health workers when they have no facilities and they have no drugs with which to address the health needs of the sick? Just to stand there and see them. As a poor, I want to, you are employing 11,000 health workers. What's the use? 